Great. Our next uh, speaker really needs no introduction um, anywhere. Michael Burke from Sydney, Australia, who has really defined um, modern endoscopic mucosal resection. He himself is a fantastic resectionist. We've all learned a lot from him. I, I do a lot of EMR and I pretty much do it however Michael uh, tells me to do. So he's going to talk with uh, a, a very similar topic, ESD for rectal tumors in Australia. Why is rectal ESD necessary? Welcome, Michael. Uh, thanks so much, Doug. Dear Professor Nui uh, and colleagues, many thanks for this uh, great well, opportunity like to speak to at Tokyo Live. Live. I'm going to talk about ESD for rectal polyps. Why is it necessary? So I'm going to uh, lay out to the background, talk? talk about lesion assessment, talk about EMR versus okay. ESD, and then the right idea here. of the rectum yeah, specific resection algorithm. Apply? So when we talk about endoscopic resection of mucosal lesions in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, we need to remember our goals, safely, precisely, efficiently, and completely resect the target tissue for cure, minimize invasiveness, and avoid patient injury, avoid recurrence, avoid unnecessary expense, time expenditure, or opportunity cost. You don't want to be wasting time doing a resection via a complex modality when it can equally Maybe be achieved the by a straightforward there, approach can... and avoid surgery with yeah, its associated morbidity. Do you know how to uh, share your screen? Yeah, it's been shared. Okay, then uh, please go ahead. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so I'm, I'm going to cover these things. Apologies for that. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and for the honor of participating in this great meeting. So. I'm going to talk about the background, lesion-specific considerations, EMR and ESD, and then this idea of the rectum-specific resection algorithm. So when we talk about endoscopic resection, I just covered this, but basically we want to be safe, precise, effective, completely resect, minimise invasiveness. That's important. Avoid patient injury. Avoid recurrence. Don't waste time or money doing something that's much more complicated when it can be achieved much more easily and finally avoid surgery and its associated morbidity. So we have to make the best evidence-based uh, medicine therapeutic decision for the patient and the healthcare system and not the best decision for the doctor and the ego. So it's the best decision for the patient and the healthcare system. When we wrote this guideline, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about safety and efficacy, but what we omitted to cover and what needs to be covered in future guidelines is this concept of lesion location because the three of them are in a triumvirate of interrelated uh, uh, factors that influence outcomes. So if we talk about lesion specific treatment algorithms, again, what is missing? It's basically lesion location, this idea of left versus right because left colonic surgery is much more dangerous. In fact, three times more hazardous than right colonic surgery. And, um, and also the, then rectal specific uh, considerations. And when we think about resecting lesions, we always make these considerations, is it adenomatous or serrated? And then how big is it? Can I get rid of this? Yeah, good. Um, and how big is it? So, so we need also to bear in mind that concurrently, while we're having this discussion about the role of ESD and the expanding role of ESD. In fact, in the rest of the colon, we're driving things the other way. We're doing piecemeal cold snare polypectomy for adenomas of increasingly larger size because of the enhanced safety, the comparable efficacy, and the same outcome in long-term follow-up. And this, this will come to pass. These lesions will finally be removed. These are currently being done cold snare, and these next two will be done cold snare in the longer term, and we'll be left with these bulky lesions, which will be need to be managed by hot snare diathermy or ESD or EMR. So it, it is all changing, and it's changing everywhere. And then we have, we heard the, the excellent talk by Sergey Kantsevoy and, and colleagues earlier about full thickness resection. And we have other modalities for full thickness resection, not just the Avesco modality, but also snare-based intentional full thickness resection for this early cancer in an older comorbid patient. We can deliberately uh, take the muscle layer and then clip this up and you see the margin of resection here. So there's lots of things we can do. And as I said, large flat lesions, we can inspect them carefully, no concern for invasive disease. This can be removed by piecemeal cold snare resection. There's definitely a learning curve, it's time consuming, 
and recurrence may be more frequent, but that's going to be easily treated down the line. So when we come to EMR, we know all of these things. It's very efficient. We've got that little problem with bleeding, which seems to have been largely mitigated by clipping in the right colon. We don't have any delayed perforation because we have the idea of deep neural injury and the inspection of the post-EMR defect. We now know that recurrence is easily treated, but moreover, it can be avoided. And then we're just left with this hard point of submucosal invasive disease that needs surgery. So if we look at the sort of thing that can be achieved by, by EMR, this is a large laterally spreading flat lesion in the proximal rectum in a physician that was referred to our service and was actually sent for surgery. Um, he or she was gonna have a low anterior and then and said, no, I, I wanna have endoscopic treatment. So once we carefully inspect it, then we can in fact fully remove it. Um, and you'll see here, beautiful post EMR defect. This patient will not get a recurrence. Um, particularly if we do the snare tip treatment of the, of the margin. And if they did get a recurrence, it's easily treated. So this takes about an hour and a half. If we did that by ESD, that's an all day job. It's an all day job. And the patient's no better off for all of that. So, um, and now because of snare tip uh, or thermal ablation of the post MR margin, we can, of course, uh, aim for a very, very low recurrence rate. So this uh, randomized trial that was published in gastro in, from four centers, our place enrolled about half the patients, um, incorporated the learning curve. And when I went back and looked at some of the injures, uh, images from the referrers where they had recurrences, I could see they didn't bother to fully treat the margin. So fully treating the margin is very, very important. And even I myself, this is a slide that I used to use as a sort of poster hang up. What a great job we did here. But look at this. This is imperfect. So this was my sort of uh, gold standard early on. But we no longer treat the margin like this. We're much more aggressive. And we're totally certain that we completely ablate the margin. So we aim for this dense white penumbra of this sort of Mount Fuji effect, which is topical given we're speaking in Japan. Um, and, and we want to completely eliminate the margin. As Doug alluded, this was presented in the uh, virtual DDW, and the recurrence is now down to about 1.4%. Uh, and this is, um, you know, 1,500 patients enrolled and follow up in, in nearly 700 patients. So this one's just been prepared for publication. So this is what we're aiming for. So after the learning curve, and indeed in my own practice, I never have a recurrence now. So forget about the role of ESD in preventing recurrence. Also forget about the role of ESD in managing lesions at the anorectal junction. We've shown in a big study that these can be safely and effectively managed by EMR. Very effectively, the hemorrhoids are resistant to snare capture. You don't need to worry about precipitating hemorrhoidal injury or bleeding. It just doesn't happen. Um, so in 487 rectal LSLs referred to Westmead, I think it's all Westmead data or maybe a bit of um, Queensland data as well, 100 ARJ and outcomes between the all rectal between the rectal and the ARJ lesions basically the same. And in long term follow up, you see recurrence in just one case, I think, just one case in the snare tip group. So uh, it's very very effective way to manage large flat lesions in the distal rectum. And of course, as I mentioned, recurrence, this was presented at the DW plenary the year before. We haven't quite finished writing this manuscript, but recurrence is easily treated by cold avulsion followed by snare tip soft coagulation. You simply excise the normal tissue around the lesion, and then you can uh, proceed to uh, snare tip and then cold avulsion, snare tip soft coagulation in the center, and then clip it up if you need to. We've published this, of course, very severely scarred lesions can be treated in this way. Of course, you know, if you have a depressed lesion like this, but this is benign, we can do ESD, but it's very time consuming. We can use the traction technique um, that Haru so elegantly uses in the upper GI uh, to achieve better results. And finally, just to make the point before I talk about ESD, previously attempted lesions can also, I often hear people saying, well, it's scarred, it'll have to be done by ESD. That's just complete nonsense, rubbish. It doesn't need to be done by ESD. It can be done by EMR very swiftly, effectively. Uh, um, uh, use auxiliary techniques like this hot ache or cold avulsion, and you end up with a very low recurrence rate. And a lot of this data precedes a snare tip. So with the snare tip 
impact on this experience, I think it's going to be approaching zero. You see some terrible examples of scarred lesions here. And bear in mind in the rectum, there's a bias for the referrer to attempt the lesion over and over and over. So finally, when you get hold of it, it's something like this, this, this uh, five centimeter lesion attempted five times over five years. You see there's adenoma here, it's all scarred, terribly stuck down, but we can of course resect it. There's no full thickness hole there, so we don't have to clip that up. We can do snare tip, uh, cast technique, cold evulsion followed by snare tip, and um, the lesion can be completely removed. So now we have to talk about the role of potential cure of superficial submucosal invasive cancer. And that needs to be considered as either overt or covert. When we looked at um, uh, modeling the outcomes of ESD for all colorectal lesions with a cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness analysis, and we looked at the incremental cost effectiveness over an 18 month time horizon, comparing wide field EMR against selective ESD versus universal ESD. ESD for all lesions, wide field EMR, just EMR for everything, surgery if suspicion of cancer, and then selective ESD if we suspect cancer. And an 18 month timeline looking at uh, uh, costs and so forth. So 1,723 patients, nearly 2,000 lesions, overall cancer 8%, but low risk cancer is only about a third of all cancers, 3.1%. Um, and endoscopic assessment for cancer, sensitivity very poor. So why is that? I'll come to that in a moment. And selective ESD is more cost-effective than wide-field EMR, marginally more cost-effective. It prevents 19 surgeries per 1,000 cases. And with selective ESD, only 43 ESDs per 1,000 cases, considering all comers are performed. So 4.3% of all cases. And universal ESD would only prevent another 13 surgeries compared with selective ESD, but at an incremental cost per surgery avoided of $210,000, not to mention the time wasted, given that it takes at least three times as long. But when we drill into this, it's very important to remember that the rectum is at a much greater risk for submucosal invasive cancer, threefold greater. So in the colon, the risk is 6.2%, but in the rectum, it's actually 16.7%. And about half the cases are low risk. So the rectum is a different organ to the colon and needs to be considered completely differently. So when we look at a large flat lateral spreading lesion, if we see a demarcated zone such as we see here, then this is at least high grade dysplasia, possibly early cancer, overt SMIC, we should treat this by ESD. And we've been doing this for about five, six, seven years now. I've been doing upper GI ESD. We've been doing ESD for best part of 12 years or more. So. Um, it's a lot easier to learn in the stomach and indeed also easier to learn in the esophagus than it is in the rectum because the rectum is very vascular. The esophagus is very linear. It's very safe. We know from poem experience, it's very safe. And stomach is also thicker, less vascular, but the rectum has a lot of blood vessels. So it's more tricky. So this is an example, beautiful example of a young man with early cancer in a large Lat lateral spreading lesion, flat, you see the disruption to the pit pattern, microvascular pattern, you know, demarcated zone. So we, of course, just changed to ESD. So we do our rectal cases on a Thursday morning. We do two rectal cases every Thursday morning. And if we need to change to ESD, we can. So we've factored that in. So patients don't have to come back. Uh, we rely, of course, on uh, a, a good um, good images images sent to us, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, so that's the end result. And you can see here ex vivo, a nice specimen, maybe five by six centimetre. For the comorbid with deep submucosal invasive cancer, they can also be treated by ESD. This is an older patient, can't be managed by surgery. We can resect this uh, and retrieve it for histology. And in those patients that are stoma resistant, this patient was referred from a colorectal surgeon. He'd run a snare through this area, excising some cancer. And we see that this is probably a T2 cancer. It's stuck on the inner muscle layer, the circular layer. So we can do an intermuscular dissection for superficial T2. So here's the tumor. You see a beautiful demonstration of the microvascular pattern. This is invasive cancer. So we make a big injection. It's relatively fixed, whether from the diathermy, and then we proceed quickly with the ESD. 
uh, mindful that there are a lot of blood vessels. So you'll see here in a moment coagulating this blood vessel, but look at that. This is what causes all the problem in the rectum. Um, and then at this point, we see that there's fibrosis or cancer extending down into the circular muscle. So we deliberately take the circular muscle and the distal rectum. And of course, now with CO2 and clip closure and other means of closure, you know, you can be more aggressive almost everywhere in the GI tract, except for the duodenum. The duodenum is very dangerous. Um, and so we do an intermuscular dissection. We take, take the circular layer, uh, preserve most of the longitudinal layer. Um, and you'll see here the end result. Just taking this off the muscle. And then this satellite lesion, it's only a small lesion. There you go. So here's the interface between circular and longitudinal. And then the satellite lesion, uh, this is just small. So we just make a big injection, chop it off on block by EMR with a big margin of normal tissue. And finally, a nice end result. Here's the interface between longitudinal and circular. Uh, patient can go home same day or next day, local anesthetic, intravenous antibiotics, oral antibiotics for five days. Um, so this idea of covert in the rectum, we know that these bulkier lesions in the distal colon have a much greater risk of having submucosal invasive cancer that we can't see. So these are the ones that we need to consider for ESD as well. We can't predict that there's cancer, but we need to suspect it. And this led us to the idea of morphology influencing sensitivity in the detection of submucosal invasive cancer. So overall performance, and I think this is about two and a half thousand cases in ACE, something like that. Overall performance is only sensitivity 67% specificity high. But when we look at flat lesions, overall performance sensitivity rises to 91% and bulky lesions, it falls to 50%. So when you have a flat lesion, if you don't see cancer, there's no cancer there. In fact, the chance that you'll miss a cancer is six in a thousand cases. It's very low. The chance that you'll miss a cancer in a bulky lesion is six in a hundred. So you need to be much more careful, particularly in the rectum. So now we consider that these bulky lesions, when we see them in the rectum, we do them all by ESD. Um, and this is a patient with two rectal lesions, a bulky lesion and a flat lesion. Same day, EMR, snare tip of the margin. This is all benign. In fact, both lesions are benign. And this one by ESD, large blood vessel. Um, I can tell you this took about 15 minutes, if that. And this took about an hour and a half. So I don't have the time to waste uh, doing things for patients that aren't going to benefit them. So if we do need to do ESD, we absolutely do it, but we don't do it on anyone who doesn't need it. So bulky lesions, as I said, get managed by ESD. And this is some of the ideas we tried to bring out in this review of the role of ESD in the West uh, published in Gastro last year or the year before. So here we see this 18 centimeter mixed nodular, almost fully circumferential lesion in the rectum referred by the colorectal surgeon. This can't be managed by TAMIS or any of those transrectal techniques, surgical techniques, uh, but we can do it safely, effectively by ESD, takes four or five hours. Here's the anal canal, here's the, the rectum to the mid rectum. This is the squamous margin that tore off when we're trying to get the specimen out of the rectum. Uh, you can excise over the squamous tissue very safely. The patients can't tell, it doesn't bother them. If we have a more convenient circumferential lesion like this, we can also uh, do it by using Yamamoto's tunneling technique. This is also very safe and we can excise the, the proximal rectum in a nice uh, tube of calamari, which can be submitted for histopathology on, on a specimen syringe like that. But it takes time. Uh, so we don't do it. Here's a multiple, unless we need to, multiply recurrent distal rectal and anal canal. Look at the scarring here. Uh, but again, this can be managed by ESD, again, into the intermuscular plane, underneath the fibrosis, 
it's amazing the patients don't have issues with continence, I suppose, because there is some stricturing of the anus and afterwards we do some dilatation, but then uh, the patient can then do self-digital dilatation in the longer term. So this led us into the idea of the rectum-specific resection algorithm, and this data was presented at the virtual DDW this year. Um, and basically, if we look at this historical cohort of universal EMR versus selective resection, um, over the last now three years, we haven't updated the data, so probably there's another 100 cases. It's about a 50-50 split, maybe a few more for EMR because they're flat lesions. So the default is any bulky lesion goes to ESD, but if it's a flat lesion, we evaluate it, we see no evidence for cancer, then we manage it by EMR. How often do we get it wrong? Well, just one, 1.6%. Uh, and curative oncological resection, not as good as you'd hope with the resection algorithm, only 38%, because a lot of these lesions do have lymphovascular invasion or otherwise. So you don't cure as many people, at least uh, by criteria, as you would hope. Nonetheless, many of these patients can still just go for adjuvant therapy. So in summary, uh, flat lesions, optical detection of SMIC is high sensitivity and can reliably guide treatment decisions. That paper is uh, soon to come out. The rectum's uh, certainly a different organ to the colon. Only flat lesions without overt SMIC should be treated by EMR. The remainder require consideration of ESD. And I think rectal lesions really need to be managed in specialised centres. Any rectal lesion above two centimetre has to go to a specialised centre. In the absence of optical evidence for deep SMIC, complete endoscopic resection provides definitive T-staging. So this argument that we should do other things, we have to think of the rectum like the esophagus. Just cut the whole tumour out and then you can decide what should be done because all treatment options are still available to the patient. Um, recurrence should be infrequent because of the thermal ablation, virtually negligible, and it can be treated in follow-up easily, very easily. And scarred recurrent previously attempted lesions are easily treated by EMR casts. They don't require ESD. And finally, in the elderly, comorbid or stoma-resistant, uh, locally advanced lesions can be resected by ESD for luminal cure, and then adjuvant therapies can then be considered. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk at this meeting. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was that was absolutely fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So just just to clarify that you you made it really uh, clear for the rectum, but for the bulkier lesions, the the granular uh, lesions, mixed nodular lesions above the rectum, you'll still take those out by EMR, even despite the somewhat increased risk of cancer. Yeah, in the right colon, I think. Um, uh, we, we generally just do EMR because the cancer risk is so low. It, it seems to be that if there's going to be cancer, it's overtly manifest. So it's just a couple of percent. And in the left colon, uh, we generally still also do EMR. And it, it turns out that we rarely get it wrong. Um, and of course, right colonic surgery, coming back to the right colon, is very safe. So I think to spend the extra time for the very low risk of cancer in a bulky lesion, I, I think it's better just to resect it. And then if there is some cancer, patient can have an operation from which they recover well and do well long-term. Laparoscopic right hemi is a very safe operation. And the left colon, you know, maybe that will change in the future. We didn't, you know, eight to 10 years ago, we didn't think that that ESD would have such a big role in the rectum as it's appearing that it, it may well have. But I, I don't want to... Uh, uh, on the other hand, overemphasize the role of ESD in the rectum. I think still lots of lesions are managed very well by EMR. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have a sense yet for piecemeal cold uh, EMR, uh, what the recurrence rate is going to be. Do you have an absolute number? Your, your technique, I'm sure, is cold from beginning to end. There's no, there's no thermal aspect of any. I, I'm often asked, well, do you take the whole thing off by with a snare and then burn up the edge. I assume it's an entirely cold technique, but do you know yet uh, what the what the recurrence rate is, is going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the serrated lesions, uh, we, we published in gut, I think it's on it's online, I think, or yeah, it's about um, 5%, five or 6%, which was comparable with the EMR group. And for adenomas, I think it's gonna be around 10%. We're well into a, a randomized trial 
of cold versus hot and um, with the one of the primary endpoints being recurrence and then adverse events, of course. Um, so um, I think it's going to be around 8 to 10%. We just do it completely cold. But the advantage of cold, and I'm sure, Doug, you're aware, but everyone else should be aware that you can make the defect as big as you like. So if you have a three centimetre lesion, we usually make the defect five centimetres. And when I take off polyps on screening lists cold, if it's a five millimetre polyp, I make the defect 15, 20 millimetre. I usually chop it out and chop the sides off as well uh, because it doesn't add any risk to the patient. So you want to be completely certain. I sometimes see people adopting the size of their cold resection to the size of the polyp. And to me, that makes no sense. And you risk leaving behind a small amount of adenoma. So the advantage of cold is you can make a massive resection defect without adding any additional risk to the patient. You just have to have the skill to do it. And if you keep doing it, if you keep making your resection defects big, then you will develop that skill. And you just need to be systematic, head from left to right, and use a lot of water jet to expand up the submucosa. And if it's a large lesion, we use dilute adrenaline in the submucosal injectate to minimize bleeding, which really helps to uh, allow you to follow the residual adenoma. Fabulous. Norio, Norio, any questions from you? I can't. Um, Norio, can you hear Norio, Michael? Uh, not Sorry. Yet. <laughs> I have been muted again. Okay. Uh, that was great, great, great discussion talk. Thank you very much. And I have several questions for you. Uh, first one is, um, I think your point is well taken. This uh, stratification of the lesion, which needs more ag ag aggressive resection, unblocked resection versus piecemeal is okay. And um, how are you be able to emphasize the diagnostic part? Because in the United States, we try to educate physicians. They're not too much interested in, interested in diagnostic advanced endoscopy and advanced imaging. How would you be able to do that? Yeah, to separate um, those lesions. It's funny, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we just can't get people to look at polyps carefully. Uh, but the the simple thing, I think, one of the problems has been we've overcomplicated it. And you know, we have all the various classification systems. But what I like to teach is this idea that the benign polyp is homogeneous. So when you look at the pit pattern, it's all the same. It's like looking at a nice Persian rug that's got a repetitive pattern. And when you see a cancer or an early cancer, there's a demarcated zone where there's an area that's not the same as the rest. And if you teach them to look at the demarcated area and compare with the normal overall pattern, people start to be able to learn this. I know because you know we have four or five fellows each year, new fellows, and they come, they have no clue but after a couple of months, they can do it very, very well. Um, and oftentimes I find I'm looking at things and I ask them, what do you think? Because <laughs> I'm not too sure myself. Um, right. So it, it can easily be taught. Um, okay. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, uh, in Australia, is it uh, the referral center is well established? Do, do, does the common practice uh, physician in a common practice, private practice, do they try to remove the polyp for three, four centimeter or they just automatically send to referral centers? Um, I think it's similar to the US. So there are people who are certainly capable and will will uh, remove the polyp. Um, and then, and there are others that generally just refer on. And there are others still who refer to surgeons because there's right. a, you know, for some reason a reward or you know, they know full well, it's it's a sort of cognitive dissonance. They're like, they're smoking, thinking they're not going to get lung cancer, but they're sending the patient off for surgery when they know full well it could be removed endoscopically with the same, with a better outcome for the patient. So, um, yeah, so I think it's very similar to the US. What, what I have found over time is that um, we get more and more complex lesions. So the diffusion of expertise is happening and people are handling lesions in their own, well, in their own referral centers. We're not the only referral center. Um, and for instance, in the last two years, I think we have one ileocecal valve lesion every week. Um, so that's about 10, because we have 10 lesions a week, um, two centimeter or greater referred in. And, you know, like one of them's ICV every week. Mm -hmm. Michael, you I showed mean, uh, you showed some. 
that are circumferential or or near circumferential, which sometimes seems to produce some um, stricture formation even in the rectum, for example. Do, do you rely only on dilation? Is there anything else such as steroid injection into the submucosa at the end of the procedure? Anything that can help prevent stricture formation? Yeah. So um, in the right colon, stricture formation is never a problem, uh, almost never a problem. It definitely will occur if you use a snare tip. If you have a, you know, 95% you use snare tip, it really ramps up the stricture rate. Um, but we use steroid enemas for the first six to eight months, uh, six to eight weeks. So uh, prednisolone enemas. And then we just bring them back. The stricture doesn't start till about week four. We have them on a low residue diet and um, uh, uh, stool softeners. And, um, you know, some people have a bad stricture for about four to five months, but I can tell you they have to come maybe five, six, seven, eight times, but, the, and they travel long distances, like three, 400 kilometers to have their stricture dilated with us. But to a person, they're very, very grateful that they've avoided surgery. They, maybe they self-select, but, you know, commonly at the end of the relationship, they're sad to leave. And they usually give us the present, so it all works. <laughs> the, one of the study that you mentioned about uh, the cost effectiveness, um, that was a little bit of a disadvantage to the ESD because of the two days adm uh, admission to the hospital, the ESD reimbursement is higher than we get. So I think it's a, it's a little bit diluted. I think ESD has a little better cost effectiveness than that published. Yeah, may maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and as you, as you start to feel, uh, once you get in, into the ESD, uh, the reward getting everything in, in, in one and getting the pathology precisely is, is uh, something that we cannot really get with a piecemeal resection. Yeah. When do you think it's, yeah, sorry. My question is, when, when do you think it's more, um, when you get used to it, um, the main, what was the way to say? When do you think it's the ESD will be more preferred uh, in the comfort level? Um, do you think it's ever take over some of the lesions? I mean, if you feel comfortable and take less time, you may convert to the ESD rather than piecemeal reception. What is your take? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm, of course, ESD, uh, uh, does give you more accurate histopathology, but we haven't suffered with EMR not having that facility. Maybe it's quite rare that we, well, we, we, we've virtually never seen a delayed cancer in like thousands of patients. I think in the database, we have four and a half or nearly 5,000 patients with two centimeter or more lesions. Uh, don't get me wrong, we do a lot of ESD. I, I bet you I do more ESD than you, Norio. I do a full day of it on Tuesday. <laughs> and, wow. and all Thursday morning. So, and I do, so in Barrett's, we never, anything that looks um, 10 millimeter or more early cancer, we do ESD. So I do a lot of ESD um, mm -hmm. and I love doing it, but I just never want to waste the time doing it when it's not going to help the patient. So I think, um, uh, you know, it, if it becomes faster, comparable with EMR and is safe, uh, then, then maybe we might do ESD more often. But don't forget that right now we're driving things the other way. We're going to do cold snare resection for large flat adenomas. I think that will yep. really come to pass. I, I'll be interested in Doug's perspective. Do you think that's going to happen, Doug? Large flat adenomas, cold yeah, snare? I, I do. I, I'm still, uh, I think the key thing to understand is, is going to be the recurrence rate. But I agree that if the recurrence rate is 10% and we can deal with the uh, recurrences simply. Um, and uh, we'll have to use, I, I, in my experience, we probably need to convert to electrocautery when we, we treat the recurrence because the cold resection still creates a scar. And, um, I, I, and so I do that. I know you've described entirely cold techniques there, but uh, you know, it's uh, so safe. And as, as long as the patients come back and we can get a very high cure rate, I think it's gonna be a very promising uh, approach. Of course, there's the limitation of a bulkier lesion where you just can't cut through yeah. uh, with cold techniques. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. uh, just to pick up on that point, I think really exciting time in tissue resection in the colon because we have a competition between all these various techniques and, and we need to work out 
what what technique is most suitable for the various different lesions. Things have really changed. And in 10 years, I, I think we'll look back and and we still won't have been, you know, right now we can't predict what will happen. Things will certainly change uh, beyond what we can imagine. Great. Okay. Excuse me. I think it's all this. Excuse me. Oh, uh, Yuta, yeah, Yutaka. From Tokyo. May I have some question shortly? Sure. Oh, yeah. Congratulations Please. for your excellent presentation as usual. So I talk about the risk of SM invasion in my talk. So I'd like to, just one question for the cold smear polypectomy. So we are a little bit concerned about the depth of resection for cold smear polypectomy. So in Japan, we just limited the cold smear polypectomy only for the adenome, benign adenoma, and the size is less than one centimeter. How, how about the uh, vertical margin positive rate in your series when you perform the cold smear polypectomy for large adenomas? Yeah, so we haven't, uh, this is a good question, Yutaka. We, 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 I'm familiar with that uh, excellent uh, Japanese study which looked at the depth of resection, which, you know, 80% of the time there's no submucosa. So on the one hand, theoretically, it's not as good as we would hope. But on the other hand, I think the reality will prove that it's it's quite effective. We know from the small adenomas that it works very well, and we perhaps we don't have enough piecemeal data yet in the sort of 10 to 20 millimeter lesions to know how effective uh, it's it's going to be in the long term. But if you look back and you see a scar, I mean the scars are easy to find after cold resection, even for you know smaller lesions less than 10 millimeter. If you biopsy those those scars, you don't you d you don't see any residual adenoma. So I don't think it has to be on block. And even though the plane of resection is not uh, in the submucosa most of the time, it you know in reality it, it probably doesn't matter too much. And we know also from the Tatucci study that we published in GIE, um, when we biopsy the cold snare protrusion, there's no residual adenoma. Well. So. There's a lot more work to be done. I think it's exciting. We need to, we all of us need to really, uh, you know, uh, get down and do these studies and and really understand it so much more. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Fantastic. I think as a case selection, is proper properly choosing the right method to remove is it's really the key message. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, thank you, Doc. It was a fantastic talk. Uh, 